On this episode of China Unscripted, how Chinese money is invading the Western African country of Mauritania, and what resources are hidden beneath the sea and beneath the sand. Fish. There's no fish beneath the sand, Shelley. Sandfish. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> That. <laughs> oh. Welcome to China Uncensored. Damn it. <laughs> We're off to a great start today. Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And before we get into a very intellectual conversation, I'd like to introduce tonight's tea from our sponsor, Path of Cha. Tonight we're drinking Yellow Goddess Huangyin Guanyin Wuyi Rock Oolong Tea. That's a long name, but smell it. Mmm. Mmm. Taste it. We've been having a streak of oolongs lately, I think. There's a huge variety of oolongs. They are the best uh, family of tea, I feel, to really explore. The interesting thing about this tea in particular is that it kind of combines the traits of, like, the Iron Goddess Tie Guan Yin style tea, which is very kind of roasty, with the uh, sort of aroma of the Golden Osmanthos oolong teas. So it's a nice little combination of those two. Oh, wait, there's a golden osmanthus oolong tea? Oh, yeah. It's mm. way better than the silver osmanthus oolong. Mm. And better what about than the, the bronze. bronze? Mm. Mm. Oh, the bronze got disowned. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, this has a... I, I notice a very nice aftertaste to this. Like, it kind of lingers uh, with fragrant aromas. It's definitely very floral. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the golden osmanthus oolong thing coming in. What do you think about it, Matt? It is delicious. That's great. So, if you'd like to try some delicious tea from Path of Cha and help out China Unscripted, you can get some tea by going to go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted. Okay, let's begin the interview. Joining us today is Nasser Wadadi, a Mauritanian American activist. He's also a Middle Eastern North African consultant. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You bet. So I don't think a lot of Americans really know much about Mauritania. Can you tell us a bit about it? I, I've heard that's where Atlantis was. <laughs> you know, I myself didn't know where it was until I was born there, so don't feel bad. <laughs> uh, Mauritania is the big box separating Morocco and Senegal uh, um, off of the Atlantic coast in northwest Africa. It's uh, an immense territory. It's about Texas and a half, if not twice the size of texas nothing's bigger it, than texas well <laughs> sorry lone star state uh <laughs> the population however is minuscule it's like got a four million population wow so it's a so it isn't territory. bigger than texas Ooh. exactly so vast 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 arid areas and also more relevant to our talk about China, interestingly, is it's uh, about five, five to six hundred miles of Atlantic coast in some of the richest uh, f uh, fishing areas in the world, because the country is basically off of uh, um, through, a, through a stroke of, I guess, geology luck. Um, it's right off the, the Madeira and the Canary Island currents, which are natural vector vectors that create this zone for, for fish um, uh, mating, which makes it extremely rich compared to other places on the African coast. Mauritania and Western Sahara um, are some, some of the richest um, uh, fishery zones actually in the continent. And that's that's where the the China connection begins. Even though that it's a story that's been near about fifty some years in the making. Well, I mean, you would think I'd be the most interested in uh, China's role in uh, your country, but actually, no. I'm I'm more interested in about the uh, Rickat structure, the uh, proof that uh, Atlantis was there. So tell tell me more about Atlantis. Ah. 
You know what? Like the first thing that I tell you is we, the locals, uh, uh, pronounce it Richette. Okay. Uh, so, and, and that's, no, it, it's not your fault. You're a native English speaker. There's a, there's a subtext there, which is it's the French spelling CH instead of SH. And that's because the country was a French colony gaining its independence in 1960. Ah. And yes, and that that's the one of also the reasons why the country is obscure, because it's like the its two main languages are Arabic, not widely spoken in the Western world, I guess, and French, not that widely speak, spoken either. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's not so well known because the elite are covering up Atlantis. <laughs> I bet you if the, our local elite, if they get their hands on Atlantis, be assured it's going to be on eBay in 24 hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so just, just for people listening who probably have no idea what I'm talking about and think I'm crazy, I am crazy, but uh, uh, well, who was it, Socrates or Plato, who talked about uh, Atlantis having, it was a city of concentric rings. Well, this, how do you say it, Rick? Richette. 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 Richette structure yes. is like this weird series of like concentric rings, this weird dome shaped concentric rings in the middle of uh, Mauritania that some people think is Atlantis, the remnants of. Yeah, there's actually a more interesting point there, my friend. Oh, please. Uh, Richette is one of the few natural uh, landmarks that astronauts can see from space Ooh. and use to navigate and guide. Um, it, like in terms of relative position, like visually, yeah. and and in in in, in, in and there is a bit of a joke here. I mean, it's a little bit of insiders baseball, but um, it's just, as you pointed out, it's a series of concentric circles. But the the name that the locals use for it actually means wings, hmm. which like is a bit weird. It's like they didn't know because people didn't quite realize the structure until, until the advent of av aviation, which is um, uh, sometime in the 40s, late 40s, early 50s, and just like about 10, 11 years before the French left the country, um, they, they, dis they discovered an anomaly, which is like whenever they flew over the northern reg region of the country, which starts at Trichet and goes north, they noticed that the airplane's uh, compasses would go haywire. Ooh. And the result was, lo and behold, massive iron ore deposits. Uh, Mauritania is one of the, the top iron ore producers in the world. Mm. Well, I imagine but, the fact that you can see the structure from space was very useful to the ancient astronauts. Um, oh, I guess. I'm sure they they too would have uh, at some point needed a visual reference point if they were um, landing uh, at 18,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is China's interest in Atlantis? So uh, there's a little bit of like, think of this as like sort of an accidental story. Um, the 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 Chinese, or to be more accurate, the 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 Chinese Communist Party interest in this country, which was at the time uh, in the mid '60s, was literally just a massive arid desert for all intents and purposes. Um, was is that at the time Mauritania, four years fresh from independence, and dealing like playing a complex geopolitical game because its northern neighbor Morocco had aspirations and claims on the land claiming that they own the country and should be part of Morocco so the Mauritanians were playing this complex game and lo and behold in 1964 they they were basically trying to to beat the Moroccans at uh, at their own game which is um, international diplomacy and multilateralism using the non-alignment form, which many probably listeners don't either are too young to remember or um, have never heard of, which was like this block of nations at the time that was trying to play this sly game of being neutral, i.e. non-aligned, to either the Soviet bloc or the Western bloc. And so the Mauritanians were amongst the first countries on the African continent to recognize the, uh, the, the communist rule in China as the legitimate 
um, Chinese, like representative of China instead of Taiwan. Mm, the and Republic that, of China. Yes. And, uh, and, and that way they got their votes in order to bypass the Moroccans, um, trying basically to, 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 to sideline Mauritania and isolate it. But also they, um, th it was the beginning of a relationship where uh, until China took off, meaning economically, um, the relationship was always warm because the, the Mauritanians never missed an opportunity to remember the, to remind the, the communist government that, uh, look, we recognize you were nobody where the rest, when the rest of the world shunned you. You never forget your first. Exactly. And, 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 and sort of the, 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 the Chinese kind of reciprocated by doing at the time, these modest projects by, by, I guess, international standards, but they were significant by local standards, like building the, building a 10,000, um, spectator stadium, um, which was a nice addition, uh, um, helping with a bunch of, uh, road infrastructure projects. And then ultimately the more or more significantly building a new entire port, which was, uh, ultimately turned Mauritania into a strategic player because, um, Mali, the next nation on the right, uh, is landlocked and Burkina Faso, the, the nation after that, uh, is also landlocked and sort of a, a lot of the maritime imports usually went through Senegal in the south. But when the Chinese built the ports for the Mauritanians in 1985, that injected a new, a new, a new economic um, activity into uh, into Mauritania. 1985 was a while ago. Is that the exactly? Like That's new what kids on the block were popular in 1985. Well, well, I was thinking more like this sounds like the proto Belt and Road in some ways. Exactly, and it was like basically like step by step. You know, yes. It, it, think of it. This is one when, when the policy towards Africa uh, was more bilateral, where the Chinese were dealing with country per country. And based on like sort of reciprocal uh, relationships, and um, by the way, I should I should add is that in the seventies, um, the local Chinese embassy and the local cultural um, the local cultural center initially started dabbling, handing out Mao Zedong books, and there was actually part of like there was a small communist movement in the country, which was Maoist by inspiration. Mm. However, the Mauritanian government, and this is very interesting, like kind of sternly told the Chinese off, hmm. and they backed off. Oh, they and, did back off. Yeah, of course. Again, remember, this is China in, right after Mao Zedong and with Deng Xiaoping and oh. very polite and not, uh, and not pushy. Well, so it sounds like the initial Chinese uh, relation was actually very beneficial for Mauritania. Yes, it was very beneficial. It was even killed. And that's why I'm going. Uh, I'm explaining this because the listeners usually they they hear about Chinese encroachment in Africa or in other regions in light of the last ten years or the last fifteen years, hmm. but they don't understand that there's a history that goes back and where where you have a reference point for, for uh, where you can see China was a rather decent partner. If you put aside my like people like me will never be able to forget like the atrocities of the Chinese Communist Party. But even if you isolate that, put it aside. But like you can see that okay, you could ha you could have a deal with China without selling your soul. Whereas now, what it's been happening in the last ten fifteen years, especially in Africa, where you could not do a deal with China without selling your soul. Mm -hmm. Well, even back then, Mauritania wasn't exactly a free country. It wasn't. And it's still actually, but, but for, if we speak strictly by Freedom House standards, Mauritania is not a full-fledged democracy. But um, the difference is, is that at the time, Mauritania was not beholden to China. They couldn't just squeeze it uh, and say, hey, you have to pay us all right now or we'll bankrupt you or you have to do this and this and this. Well, it sounds like, based on what you said, has that changed? Is Mauritania now beholden to China? Increasingly, yes. And that's like sort of, um, there are, there's, there's this in particular case, which actually, um, again, goes back to the fisheries. There's 
um, you have to understand that Mauritania's GDP all total is five billion dollars. Whoa, uh, a chunk of change, um, and uh, its main export sources of income uh, are fisheries, iron ore, uh, gold. There's a little oil, and now they're discovering major um, natural gas discoveries over shore, which Chinese are not involved in that. Apparently, they tried, but for some reason, it didn't work. And, 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 and sort of basically, Mauritania's 30% of its GDP comes from the fisheries. Mm. And the, Chinese, the, 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 the corrupt Mauritanian government went ahead and signed a 25-year exclusivity deal with the Chinese um, uh, with a Chinese company uh, it's called the Fujian uh, Hondong fisheries and um, by the way it, it merits its own investigation because um, I suspect that it's part of the poly um, the China poly corporation which is basically the the arm of uh, commercial arm of the Chinese military um, but that's slightly separate conversation. So they signed this deal, giving them 25 years exclusivity with minimum, with minimum um, restrictions on how and what and when they can fish things. And um, for supposedly a, a series of investments of $100 million, which we never really materialized, uh, including uh, creating 2,500 local jobs. This, um, like this deal was signed in 2011, and the opposition and the local fishers went up in arms against it. Because comparatively, um, even if we accept the public figure of $100 million investment, it's a, it's a $100 million investment over 25 years. Whereas the European Union which negotiates a fishery deal regularly, pays 100 to 140 million euros per year of fishing. Per year? Per year. So right, why? Right, but here's, here's what I don't understand, because you said if the GDP is like five and a half billion and fisheries are 30% of that, then you're talking about it's a one and a half, 1.6 billion uh, dollar industry, right? Fishing? Yes. Yes. So Mauritania traded that for a promise of a hundred million dollar investment? Exactly. That's insane. I don't exactly. that makes no sense. No, that's exactly again, corrupt authoritarian regimes that the Chinese government basically strikes deals with at the, without any concern, without any ethical compunctions or uh, Etc. Because what the Chinese need their fish. We're going to go get our fish, and we're going to get it at the, the best price that we can get. Because what are we going to give in return? Chunk of change. They want. Which brings me to the second part of uh, of this, which is um, they've done like they've done the construction projects, but this is how they usually go. Um, the Mauritanian part, or by the way, any ex African nation or Asian nation comes and signs, gets like a credit from the Chinese government at insanely high interest rates, by the way, and says, you have 1 billion or 500 million, whatever the amount, that is going to be spent to give you this facility. And then there would be, by the way, part of the money is going to go to the Chinese labor we're going to bring. So that's not going into the local economy. And when that Chinese labor comes, total isolation from the, the population, they build their own camps, they farm their own food, and work on the project, and leave. So, um, and, 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 and like, for example, one of the promises of this uh, Hondang, uh, Fujian Hondang uh, uh, deal was is that they're going to, um, they're going to create a factory that's going to um, create jobs for the Mauritanians. It didn't quite happen. And more importantly, um, the, the, the Chinese um, trailers and ships come and fish without any sort of um, regulation or surveillance. And the local, the local fishers who live from this 
have been noticing a decline in the productivity of the sea. They're not able to fish the same quantities at the same intensities, intensities as before. All right. Well, the, the advantage of a deal that's limited to 25 years is the Chinese company doesn't need to worry about sustainability. No, no oh, that, that was the third thing that I wanted to share with you because um, the, the president who signed this deal is no longer out of, in office, is out of office. He left back in June, but, but he's still a menace looming on the country. Um, which is, again, another story for uh, another time, went on a visit last year to China, and he visited the company. And the company's chairman, according to the local Mauritanian local press, actually rather candidly started talking about what a great deal was struck with the Mauritanians. We have a 50-year deal. Wait, 50? 50. That's what the Mauritanians discovered. Basically, the government lied to the population. What? what? Yep. Well, well, so so Matt, you're wrong. It's 50 years of sustainability. <laughs> it's 50 years of depleting by the time they're going to be done with it. There's not going to be left a fish in the ocean in that place. Wow. And so what is what is the reason that the Mauritanian government chose China? Is, is it one of those things where like... Money from the EU comes with uh, calls for like social reform, whereas Chinese exactly. money does not. So because not they didn't want that. Not only that, mm -hmm. but again, everything, again, looking at the pattern of the guy, his name is Mohammed Abdelaziz. Uh, that's the, the name of the, the, the general who's, who signed this deal. Um, he is notorious for commissions. Mm. And as you know, from precedents in other countries, I don't have, like, I'm not in a court of law, uh, but using precedent from other countries, you know that the Chinese are famous for their kickbacks. And um, the, the, the kickbacks here were, first of all, we don't quite know, the, the, like, we don't know what is really in those contracts. Evidently. And, 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 and sort of the local partners who are doing logistical services for the Chinese company are his people. Huh. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I realize that, that we've made a big mistake on this show because, mm -hmm. like, activists never give us kickbacks. Yes. Wait. So we chose the wrong <laughs> side. Nasser, you're not giving us a kickback for this? Uh, <laughs> I wish. I mean, ah. No, no, no. We wish. <laughs> uh, no, I wish because you're going to be doing my bidding, and I hope that like someday I can host you in Mauritania over a great fish dinner. <laughs> if there's any fish, fish left. left. There's another story for you. Um, uh, last time I was in Spain with my wife, um, the, the Canary Islands, which are not, cl not far from Mauritania, um, we went to this fish, like great fish, uh, fish restaurant, and then we ordered, and then we kind of looked at the guy and he's like, "Oh, where did you get this fish from?" He looks at us and says, "From your country." Ooh, how did that and, make the fish taste? Well, it, it was bittersweet because ultimately, I'm enjoying the fish, but I know very well that the people who who should be who should be fed by this, who should be enriched by this, are not. So not only is China screwing Mauritania over with these bad deals, it's also essentially preventing the country from getting better deals with the West that might actually help the country develop. I, I think that actually that phrasing is very charitable. I would, I would, I would say that the Chinese are are looking at this as a plunder-free zone and that they're going to go, like, basically, this is an op o open buffet where they're going to just go serve themselves and be damned whatever is left there. We don't care. We're just going to scrap the bottom of the sea, and that's that. Jeez, and if they get all that ancient Atlantean technology, we're all doomed. <laughs> we are... Yes, that word that I cannot use in... On a, bro on a podcast. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, but, well speak, speaking of, of Atlantis, you mentioned that there's big iron ore deposits in Mauritania. 
Yes. Um, the iron ore, by the way, itself is is another is another is another story, because when as I told you, the French discovered it by sheer accident. Because remember, when they colonized that territory. They colonized it under the assumption that this is just a vast swath of desert. We don't care about, like, it's not going to provide us anything. We're colonizing it because of its position, location, connecting our North African colonies with our West African colonies. Hmm. And, and, and they actually didn't put any effort into, into finding whether there's any, the, the, hence the late discovery of the iron ore which happened some, like the, the work on this began in 1954, six years before independence. And, and then they had this, um, this company, which is majority shares held by the French, um, that was there until 1974 when the Mauritanians decided basically to be like, no, we need to revise this. We're taking over. See you. Here are, here are your shares. Bye-bye. And... Um, the uh, the the Chinese used to be to buy iron ore, and they and they still, but they haven't quite gotten a foothold in 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 exploring actually in 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 owning the mines because Western partners have done began doing that before them. And just to give you another example of the corruption of General Aziz, um, the the state-owned Paris State Oil. SNIM, which is basically Mauritania's equivalent of Aramco in Saudi Arabia, which is like this giant company, which is really a state inside the state uh, that is in charge of uh, extracting um, uh, iron ore and, and mining it. Um, he, it had this one giant deposit that is, was supposed to um, sustain the country's production for a century at a rate of three to five, uh, uh, three to uh, uh, 5,000 tons a year for a century of iron ore. And that's worth a lot of money, depending on like how, however you calculate it. Um, he went and struck a deal with an Australian company um, to sell it for a billion dollar. Oh, wow. That's way, way under what it should be worth. Exactly. Thank God that deal ultimately sank. But you get the picture. Sank you... like Atlantis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and hopefully never to be found. Mm. Uh, and, and, and again, this gives you, this is another lesson, which is, um, uh, yes, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party practices are terrible and devoid of any ethical uh, considerations or moral considerations. But it takes two to tango. That's the lesson here, that the, 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 the Chinese deals in Africa and Asia uh, are greedy, but they, 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 it's not like they, they don't have a willing partner who does this with them. And usually it's, that's why the Chinese are very, uh, very close to dictatorships and tyrants, because they will do their bidding for a cut. So you said that General Aziz is no longer the president. Does that make a difference in these, these deals? Um, you know, that's, a, that's probably, I would say, the billion dollar question. Because we don't know if the new government and the, the new president is going to listen to his popular demands and revise some of these agreements. We don't know. Of course, me and a lot of Mauritanians, um, um, I mean, I would vote for the guy, if, like, even though that I, I, I swore to never vote for anybody who's ever been in the military, but I would vote for him. If if he canceled the deal with the Chinese on the mm. fish, that's how 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 critical this thing is in my opinion, because it's not only about depleting a natural resource; it's destroying entire communities that are living on those natural resources. We have these communities. This is a unique community of people called the Imregen, and these are native people. No one quite knows their history because they've been there before anybody. 
And these guys have this unique relationship with the sea. These are guys who figured out how to work with dolphins to fish. What? <laughs> yes. Even though that they're Muslims like the rest of the population, but they have their own rituals related to the sea that you can clearly tell that these are pre-Islamic uh, animist traditions that they still hold on till today. That community is going to be destroyed if this thing keeps it, like if the fish dries out. That sounds magical. I, I know. I need more you, you, explanation. You, 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 you know, the true history of the Imregan is... They're descendants of the Atlanteans. Exactly. Oh. I don't yes. think they... it's, it's the only logical explanation. <laughs> I mean, how yeah. else would they? The yeah, these are people to them. like think of them as the equivalent of the native inhabitants, like the tribes in 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 the in the Amazon, who are completely in sync with their environment, who can tell you about every uh, uh, insect, tree and a bush in their environment. These guys are the same thing, but with the ocean. Wow. So they're not super happy about the giant Chinese fishing trawlers. Yeah, I mean, no. They're, they're, and not only that, I mean, to be fair is, is that overfishing has been pro a problem in, in the last 30 years. But this Chinese deal in particular, because it's like without, like, for example, when the Europeans sign, there's a biological pause. You can't fish for X period of, uh, of time. There are certain species you cannot touch. There are certain types of uh, 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 nets you cannot use. There are certain methods of fishing you cannot use. None of these restrictions are, uh, exist on the Chinese. So as a result, when I was a teenager, we like sort of in the height of the fishing season, we would go to the port in October, between October and January, which was the peak season, we would go, and, and I'm talking here 1986, 1985, 1987, 1988. We would go in the, um, and, and basically set, set camp at the port. And what we were, in a sense, doing, we were fishing and catching uh, at a rate of 10 to every 10, 15 minutes. And what we were concerned about at the time is whatever we were actually trying to catch just one type of fish, anything else that came out would throw it back in. That's the abundance that existed. That's no longer the case. There were no biological pauses in, 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 in the eighties. Uh, when they first started them, there were biological pauses of 15 days, then stretched to one month. Now there are three months. So no fishing for three months to try to to stock. basically give time to fish to repro for, for for fish to rep re reproduce. And so like this is a disaster by every standard. And um, on on the anecdote that I shared with you about me and my wife eating Mauritanian fish in the Canary Islands, the sad truth is that because the way the sector is like is is created. The best types of fish go get exported, and the locals are left only with sort of like the, the let's say the the, the lower quality stuff. And so, like fishing, even though you think that oh, Mauritania, Mauritania, Mauritania has these massive uh, fishing resources, it should have uh, food security and protein security, where that's not the case. Mauritania is constantly um, uh, food critical. Wow. So the lives of your average Mauritanian is not very good. No. Uh, I mean, you, you told you, GDP of 5 billion for 4 million people, um, life expectancies of 40, 47 to 50 years. It, 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 it's basically two hurricanes meeting each other, super corrupt bad governance and super predatory foreign exploitation. Well, another thing I'm wondering is because of its location, is there a possibility that China could see it as a potential military base? Funny you ask that. Funny you ask that. So, why do I have a feeling I'm not going to be laughing? <laughs> yeah, actually, when I heard the the news the first time, I wasn't laughing either. Mm. Um, there is this port like area called Njegu, which is about eighty to a hundred, no, hundred hundred 
k kilometers south of the capital, Nouakchott. Um, the Nouakchott is the capital of the country, and it's on the ocean. Um, there is this area called Ninjago, where actually the Chinese were constructing a port there. But it seems that that project stopped into, into its tracks. And you didn't hear it from me, but let's say that um, some Western countries heard about it, and they seem to have um, had a word with the Mauritanians. Now, when you say we didn't hear it from you, you understand this is a podcast that will be recorded and played. <laughs> yes, you didn't hear it from me is a euphemism of uh, is a euphemism about me being a behind the scenes guy. Okay. Wait. So I don't understand what the Western companies, the Western governments, said about in Jagu. No, in Jagu. I would tell you, in Jago, if, if the Chinese had their way and com uh, like and completed a military facility on the ocean, that is for one purpose and one purpose only, which is um, to which create is peace, a... Which is peaceful. China's peaceful rise. Well, I, I mean, China is free to, to rise just in their country, not on my soil. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 like, sort of a port in Jago means one and uh, one, one thing only which is the Chinese are building a blue, uh, blue Navy capability. And um, having a, uh, a naval base on, uh, in that area of the world is a strategic asset. And um, that basically would allow, allow the Chinese to project power not only um, in, the, in the strategic um, parts of Africa, but even transatlantic. Right. Now, a lot of people say, well, America has blue ocean capabilities. America has bases and navy bases around the world so what's the difference with you know why shouldn't china be allowed to have them oh you see that's an interesting question because that that hits uh hits very uh, close home if i were to speak as a mauritanian by the way and I'm, i am an american by choice if i were to speak as um like uh, a mauritanian i would tell you again is that uh mauritania is a small country we don't want we want to be friends with everybody but we don't want some foreign foreign bases in our territory to be used for whatever purposes as an american i would tell you is, is that look um the united states um um uh, we, uh, there's a lot of criticism that could be made about uh u.s foreign policy over the last 50 years but um there's one thing if you're a friend with America, there are dividends. You don't get rubbed blind the way the, uh, that happens to countries that are friends with, with China. And uh, the second thing is, is that the, 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 the Chinese are driven by an ideological project, which I'm not sure um, is uh, compatible with um, the, the notions and the ideas of democracy, uh, People rule um, uh, and and human rights. So there's 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 I get it that a lot of people are sour with with past American foreign policy failures, but at, I would take the United States any day over um, Chinese communist influence. So, are you saying all of the problems of Africa are not caused by white people? I am saying that I would say that the problems of Africa. Are, are caused by corrupt rulers who didn't come from the moon. These are native people who were born there. And I would say that other parts of problems of Africa have been caused by white people over the past century. And I would say that now we have the Chinese Communist Party trying to displace, take the place of... Uh, of the white people and start behaving like the white people of the 19th century, not the white people of the 21st century. So did, that's not good. Yeah. That's, did, go ahead. No, I was going to ask how the Mauritanians feel about China. In the 80s, in the 70s and the 80s, the even to the 90s, um, pub, Mauritanian public opinion was very positive about China because China's was see, was seen as this uh, this foreign partner that didn't meddle in in internal affairs, 
and generally had a very light footprint. They come, they make projects, shake hands, see you. And um, and 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 the Mauritanian sort of uh, at some point, and this is a true story. Um, at some point in uh, in sometime around 1997, 98, um, the there was a, a high a high Chinese a high level Chinese delegation that c- comes to visit, um, and and they were like basically. There were bilateral talks, and sort of the 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 Chinese were reminding the Mauritanian um, their Mauritanian government uh, partner, like sort of uh, counterparts, saying, "Hey, by the way, you guys seem to have forgotten. We still have money from the last aid package that we gave you and that you haven't used. What do you want us to do for with it?" And so the Mauritanians were scratching their heads, and then they were like, "Yeah, build us a new presidential palace." It, so that that was the perception of the Chinese. It's like a little bit of a of a of a Santa mm-hmm. that comes and, and does things, and then um, and and then sends you uh, uh, every now and then could send doctors, etc. Who 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 basically um, there was no historical contentious or historical um, grievances whatsoever with the Chinese. So, at what point did Chinese Santa? turn evil sometime around the 2000s why I guess <clears throat> Jiang Zemin sorry I was just coughing Jiang Zemin yes it's around the time of Jiang Zemin and sort of this I mean the historical mistake that the Clinton administration made which was like thinking that giving China access to the world trade organization and that, that somehow the Chinese are going to mellow down and 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 start behaving like the rest of the nations, and that huh. they will stop stop being communists. I and know, again, God. China is is in the process of building uh, an empire. And when you're building an empire, um, in or rather, contention is is that the Chinese part of the tragedy of the Chinese is that they're coming to this whole empire building after empire became uh, um, um, ran out of fashion. And um, building empire, like basically, uh, uh, is something that requires a lot of nasty um, uh, dealing and wielding. And the Chinese are unfazed by that. And um, they came to the conclusion that, like, they see Africa as this huge, a combination of a huge iron ore or mine, oil field. And natural uh, uh, natural research, uh, resources uh, depository, and also a, a huge market to dump in um, all of their of their pr- uh, products, and so that they want to capture it. And some people, somewhat cynically, uh, point out that the Chinese are trying to do in Africa what European powers did to China in the 18th and the 19th century. Well, I learned from watching Chinese movies like Wolf Warrior that the Chinese are actually, you know, peaceful people who are saving the Africans through war because it's bad Wolf Warrior. Americans. Well, I wouldn't. Again, <laughs> uh, for example, a few years ago, I think around 2011, 2012, at the height of the Arab uprisings uh, in Algeria, which didn't have an Arab Spring, there was a huge riot that broke out, and they were like over 30 wounded. Basically, the locals um, uh, went after the local Chinatown because they put uh, the local um, uh, weavers, um, textile uh, uh, textile business, uh, like uh, factories and producers out of business. And the population was super angry. And, and wherever you go in the continent today, People are souring over the Chinese over two things because they see them as basically enabling and empowering their dictators, like uh, as in the case in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Mauritania, and in other places. And then, and, and sort of like China is no longer seen as like sort of the benevolent, um, you know, brotherly fellow poor country, which was the image in the 70s and the 80s. I have a question about the Chinese loans that are going to Mauritania or more like the the payments right in exchange for the fishing rights uh, are those payments being made in 
Chinese renminbi or in dollars or in the local currency? We don't know because the uh, no one quite saw no one quite saw the agreements that were actually signed. Um, there were copies that were 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 uh, published pub- uh, published by the government, which we came later to know that they were either not complete or or censored, and that detail isn't there. I only ask because if you get your Chinese loan in Chinese currency, like you can't just go down to your local currency exchange, your local currency exchange shop, and change it for whatever. Like you. It's too much money for that, right? So you basically have yeah. to use that to buy Chinese, Chinese goods. goods. Yes, correct. And by the way, speaking of all of this, um, uh, the 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 I invite any anyone who 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 has some time on their hand, who know Chinese, to go investigate these like what is available out there in Chinese on Chinese websites about these, uh, the, like sort of these deals. Because um, we're a little bit operating blindly. Uh, the government is lying to us, not telling us all the picture. And sporadically, you find things that the Chinese said, but we can't quite read what they're saying. So there's a knowledge gap that needs to be bridged. Well, great. So anyone listening who thinks they can do that, you know, do that work. We can connect that. We can connect people to that. No, it would be a great help to actually know what the Chinese are saying about this and what they're promising. Because, um, I- again, sporadically, because that's the difficulty of uh, for people who live in sort of these kind of authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes cor- who are corrupt and and opaque, is that we don't really know half of the time. We don't really know what's going on. And 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 like for example, two years ago, the Chinese. Uh, handed two new combat vessels to the Mauritanian Navy at a discounted price. At least that's what the Mauritanian government told the population. And, you know, knowing China's precedence is like, wait, well, they're not going to give anything for free. There, there must be a counterpart. What was it? What was it? Did you ever find out? Um, again, we suspect that it's it's it was like a sweetener that was thrown um, in, uh, into the mix after the Chinese realized that there's massive popular resistance um, and, and, and rejection of the, of the fisheries deal. And um, again, the Chinese all the time try, are trying to... Um, they have actually two sour spots in Mauritania, which they're always trying to dance around. The first one is obviously the fisheries deal. And the second one is the issue of the Uyghurs. Because again, remember, Mauritania is a hundred percent Muslim country, and um, the Mauritanian population, like once they find out the full picture about what is being done to the Uyghurs in China, I think that will become a little bit of a problem uh, for them because the Mauritanian government will be also in a pretty sticky position if the population finds out and starts protesting. Mm, we have China and the government will have a problem on its hands. Of course, the issue is that they don't like the population doesn't fully know what's going on. And I would say that um, the, the 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 Chinese have always been uh, um, they entice the government. Like here's an example: um, after the President Trump started the commercial. The commercial, uh, the trade war. The Chinese started propag- propagandizing through their embassy in Nuakchot. They even issued a white paper that they distributed to the local press about about uh, about the trade war. And basically, it was the Chinese version of the story, um, which is America bad, 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 um, and China good, good, good. So the U.S. embassy in Nuakchot just published one. Post Facebook post where they talked about China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Chinese went berserk. But how did the Chinese even know? Because they're not allowed to access Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Well, clearly in in Mauritania they do. Uh, So and they use Facebook in Mauritania. 
you mentioned briefly that there were protests or there was like a not protest but like a lot of public opposition no there were protests by fishers in 2011 yeah. by the opposition there were even blows were traded at the parliament do you think there could ever it could ever get to the point like let's say the chinese communist party keeps kind of overstepping or taking advantage of Mauritania in a way that it gets out more and more to the public it, recently what happened in malaysia was that you know when they voted out their corrupt prime minister and the new prime minister came in and was like we have to renegotiate all these china deals do you think something like that could happen in mauritania i pray to god that something like that happens in mauritania because um it, 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 as i mentioned to you it's just like all you have to do is open the annual report about uh, about Mauritania and the World Bank, and you understand that this stuff is not kids' play. This isn't vital. Like I would, I would go as far as and say that the 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 future of an entire generation of people ha- hangs on to this. So I hope to God that something like that happens. But I would, if I were to add something, is is that knowing how the Mauritanian ruling class is, they're not going, they're not like sort of they they. To them, China has been this cow that they could milk um, that that gives them things without too many strings attached, strings that they care about, of course, meaning a scrutiny over human rights, democracy, um, rule of law, transparency, none of that. And China becomes basically a quick cash stop where they can they can give them projects and things they taught, tout in front of their population saying, look, we did these great things without really ever thinking about the consequences. But if I had to volunteer a, a thought on this entire front, I would say that if the Mauritanians and that entire area, West Africa, North Africa, were to find out more about what is done to the Uyghurs, in China, that could be a game changer. It's an interesting idea, a sort of worldwide Islamic backlash against the Chinese Communist Party. Um, uh, and and, and it, it's the more all pertinent because morally speaking, it is absolutely, I speak here as a Muslim, I am absolutely outraged that the other day when the UN started talking about, like sort of discussed, uh, discussed the issue of the Uyghurs, the only country that stood out there clearly against what is done to to the Uyghurs were Western countries. Mm. Not one Muslim nation said a thing. I wonder if it's a similar situation where uh, the governments of those countries are getting nice Chinese kickbacks and yeah, absolutely. Like Saudi Arabia, they 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 well, don't want to upset the Chinese uh, Communist Party because. They see China as a substitute in terms of oil, oil, uh, oil market. They see it as a substitute to the American market, which has become become auto sufficient with the uh, shale oil. Um, the UAE, they don't want to mess with the Chinese. They'd rather do trade business deals with them. Uh, Turkey, Turkey kind of grumbles. Like they host Uyghurs and they talk about it, but they don't rock the boat. They don't rock the boat too much either. Uh, Indonesia, mum. Malaysia, mum. You'd think Pakistan. You'd think Pakistan is like one of the biggest Muslim nations on earth. No, because China is their sugar daddy, their 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 military ally that is produ- providing them with military hardware, financial aid, and political support in the UN against India. So again, uh, this kind of like all of this shows you that this whole notion of like all the Muslims are all, you know, one team and watching for each other's back. That's a myth. Yeah, because in this case, Saudi Arabia and Iran agree on one thing. They love China. Exactly. (laughs) That was uh, uh, Matt. I thank you for saying that because you literally that was the next thing that I was going to (laughs) say. Well, so what would you say to other countries that are dealing with the prospect of Chinese foreign investment? I would say that, like, if China, if China, judging by what happened in places like Sri Lanka, Zambia, uh, and others like uh, Montenegro, Serbia, 
Greece. Um, if the Chinese get the op uh, the opening, what will happen basically is that they will shackle the country in debt that they can never pay, and will start extracting concessions in old fashioned colonial style. They will build a port, and then um, they will they will start demanding and uh, getting access to the mineral. By the way, Mauritania is, uh, is rich in minerals. It's like um, it has, as I mentioned, iron ore. It has significant gold deposits. Um, there's uranium deposits. Um, there are copper deposits. Uh, there are gypsum deposits. And now there's natural gas, which has been exploited by BP, but the deal has not been closed yet. So um, the, the, the BP being British Petroleum, which is a, a gigantic uh, oil, uh, I'm sorry, um, natural gas offshore uh, field, which is going to be exploited jointly by Mauritania and Senegal. Um, uh, they, they, who knows? Uh, they, could, they could, next thing you know, you start, like one day you wake up and the Chinese look at you and say, hey, time to pay up the bill, the interest rate is... Um, is uh, is piling up? What are you going to give us? We want the we want the gas. We want the uh, the iron, or we want the gold. What what would the Mauritanians be able to to do? Nothing, because again, circling back to the beginning uh, of the uh, of the episodes, is that most of the the listeners, I would bet you that like ninety nine percent of the listeners would have never heard even of the word Mauritania, let alone. Um, uh, knowing that it's, it's, there's a con it's such a country. And that 1% probably would spell it M-A-U-R-E-T-A-N-I-A, -A -A, thinking it's the old British ship. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to, to be fair, when uh, I first met you and you told me you were from Mauritania, the next thing I did is Google Mauritius. <laughs> exactly. I get that every day. I got it actually from my cat, like my... Lyft driver yesterday. <laughs> it was like, I, he was like, "Where are you from?" It was like, "Yeah, I was born. I'm from I'm from Boston, but I was born in Mauritania." Oh, he was like, "Yeah, Mauritius, great place." <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And, Matt kind of gaslit me on that because, like, I was like, "Oh, we should have Nasser on to talk about Mauritania," and then like he was like, "Yes, Mauritius," and I was like, "Is he from Mauritius?" And I got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just gaslighting you. <laughs> So I got into the habit of saying Mauritius is the beautiful island in the uh, in the Indian Ocean. Mauritania is the sand island on on the western coast. Well, great! Thank you so much for joining us and, and telling us all of these horrible things. Um, <laughs> it makes you want to visit Mauritania, huh? Actually, yeah, I want to see Atlantis. I, I kind of rather visit Mauritius. <laughs> um, oh. Well, so. If somebody wanted to know more about you or what you do, where should they go? I, I guess like I'm available on Twitter at Wedadi, W-E-D-D-A-D-Y. I occasionally write in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post. And um, again, hey, if you ever have any questions, etc., tweet me uh, at Wedadi uh, on Twitter. Well, great. Yeah. Once again, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, one day, maybe we can have a Mauritanian fish dinner. That sounds excellent to me. There's only a few years left for that. Yeah. Well, oh. we can get some in the Canary Islands. We have to go yeah. to uh, China and censored oh, in Africa. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, you can always get like uh, those posters of the Rishat structure. There's satellite pictures of it. It's a gorgeous thing to have on the wall. I agree. I like the, it's, it's called, fancy it's called the eye of the Sahara. That's what the astronauts call it. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Well, great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. The podcast is over. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I was about to say that I'm a big fan of China uh, Uncensored. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I know it's because we have such a smooth use of language. <laughs> great, great transitions. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and so um, thank you for having me. I've been a huge fan of China Uncensored, and I discovered it by accident on YouTube. And this is a show that changed entirely my perspective about China, because before that I thought, like most people, that, yeah, I know – what China is about. 
um, it was China Uncensored that really, really ma made me rethink everything that I assumed to know about the Chinese government. Wow. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, and the credit goes to all of you guys. And hey, I would tell the listeners, if you are not already uh, donating to the 50 Cent Army, go for it on Patreon. Oh, wow, hey, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, I, I really appreciate that. Hey, that, that Mauritanian fish dinner, it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks again for talking to us. But uh, yeah, seriously, the podcast is over. Please leave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was fun, guys, don't you think? I always learn so much from these podcasts. I want to know more about those dolphin riders. Right? So why hasn't anybody made a movie about that? I know. Hey, that'll be the first uh, uncensored production movie. <laughs> I don't like, think we should call the production company Uncensored Productions. Okay, Uncovered Productions. You know, you know unscripted what? Productions. There we go. All right. For, for documentaries. Uh, and, and definitely, you know, that would be the first topic that we'd cover with all our knowledge. Dolphin Riders of Atlantis. There we go. It's a good title, though. It is. That sounds like a Disney movie. Kind of. Kind of. It can be a combination documentary and animated Disney movie. It's never been done before. That's the kind of thing you can expect from unscripted productions. It's kind of neither dolphin nor fowl. Uh, dolphin. Hey, isn't the Chinese for dolphin like pig of the sea? <laughs> Wait, now I have to think about what the Chinese for dolphin is. It's like hai tsun or something. Uh, you know what? I've never had to use the term dolphin. <laughs> you haven't had to use dolphin in Chinese very often? Who's going to be faster on this? Yeah, but it's okay. The main it's it's it is pig, but like not a very used word for pig. Dolphins, the pig of the sea, <laughs> delicious. Because it's high twin, but like people usually use zhu for dolphin. You mean pig? Uh, for pig, yes. Yes. So. All right. I was like, are they called Haiju? I don't remember that. Pigs of the sea. And hey, the best thing to drink if you're eating a dolphin is what? tea. What? <laughs> That's my transition, Shelley. What? How did we go from riding dolphins to eating dolphins? Oh, the pig of the sea. Delicious. Uh. All right. So, you know, tea's good to have on its own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you'd like some tea go to go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted and get some tea tonight we're drinking the yellow goddess Huang Guangyin Wei Rock Oolong tea it's a delicious one and man, yeah thanks for listening to China Unscripted once again I'm Chris Chappell I'm Shelley Zhang and I'm Matt Ganesta talk to you next time